point out is that the more shade-grown coffee that is purchased puts more pressure on those that don't use sustainable practices in their coffee growing to adopt more sustainable practices. So that's just another benefit of buying that coffee. Um, so I see we've got about 45 minutes left. I see that correctly. Let's uh, start moving through here. I think most of us are familiar with most of this equipment, right? We all own binoculars. Many of us own a scope, a spotting scope, which gives us an additional magnification, great for things like hawk watching or looking out onto the lake or you know looking across that marsh to identify those ducks. Um, uh, and as we found out earlier, most of us own and use a smartphone. Many of us use that for birding. Maybe some of us take photographs with our uh, birds with our, with our smartphone. And uh, maybe even if we're um, uh, you know, really uh, aggressive, we're recording birds' songs in the field and capturing that information. Um, I don't do that very often, but that's an area that I'm really excited to start uh, using more frequently. Um, you know, cameras have advanced so much, and I think I've just shared a little information about the different types of cameras. I um, was talking uh, with uh, one of you earlier about uh, uh, a trip to Costa Rica using a point-and-shoot camera. You get great photographs using point-and-shoot cameras these days. They're, they're such high quality. Um, they have such capability. We were having a discussion about, you know, using Wi-Fi, being able to you know, download those photos onto our laptop, um, maybe get those into our eBird records, um, so effortlessly uh, compared to even 10, 20 years ago. Uh, and then mirrorless and DSLR, these digital single lens re reflex cameras, such high quality, you can find them in various price ranges, but just make photograph efforts so much more fun for me anyway, and so much easier. So, so many of us use those, those tools, and then maybe even um, some of you um, use audio recording equipment. Even if that's your smartphone, just you know, recording a song. I, I see a lot of Facebook posts of folks doing a video and audio recording of a bird and putting it out on Birding Ohio or another site and asking for input to help them identify the bird by the song. And that's becoming more and more common. So, um, you know, for those that uh, really enjoy that, you know, you can kind of expand the kinds of tools you're using for audio recording. And, you know, we're lucky in the area to have some people that are, that are terrific at that. Um, some of you may have uh, heard um, Lisa Rainsong speak, um, a terrific naturalist who focuses on songs and calls of animals, um, insects, birds, and others, um, and, and, and she, um, she certainly uses some of this equipment in her, um, in the work that she does. Okay, so this is, is going to be a point in which we do a little bit of a deeper dive here into some of these technologies. Um, you know, this is just sort of a fun little list here about the progression of how we have used certain tools to, to find birds to share our sightings. So uh, I know this first one's a little bit theoretical, but I had a lot of fun uh, thinking about Teddy Roosevelt getting ready to go to the Dakotas and wanting to see a little, uh, or a, uh, a long built curve. And so, he, you know, because he's the president, or before he was the president, uh, you know, one of his other roles, he has this power to send a telegram, telegraph uh, message uh, out there to someone, you know, perhaps on a ranch and say, hey, where can I get, can I go out there and see a long billed curlew and him getting one back and him getting the confirmation that they're, you know, they've got a spot where he'll be able to see him and him saying, boy. <laughs> uh, but it's quite possible, right, that, that, I mean, we're talking about any way that we can communicate, so it, it's theoretically possible, but certainly over time we know that Folks would share information about birds. You know, they'd send you a letter. They they call you. Hey, you know what? Guess what we're seeing at the coast? Um, you know, black turnstones are all over the place. Um, so um, you know, these first three at least are sort of that one-to-one -one communication. That you know, birders in the 40s, 50s, 60s 
That's how they were communicating about sightings. You know, there, there wasn't the, there weren't, probably it was just the start of the phone, the phone trees. And some of you have probably been burning long enough to know that the way that we used to find out about birds is that um, we'd call in and leave a, a, a message about a bird that we saw. And then at the end of the week, someone at that bird club, the designee, would kind of collect all the sightings and he'd read that in a message that when you called the next time, you'd hear all the birds that were sighted in that past week or month. <laughs> that was the way that we found out about birds. Um, so listeries, and then of course, with the advent of the internet, these listservs, which um, kind of just converted the phone tree to the listserv, but we got lists of birds seen in the past week, uh, but uh, on a, an internet site. And then, of course, we're now in the area of, era, era of social media and eBird, where we pretty much can know what's being seen today. Tim, Tim made the, the comment that you know their their tools, their collection of information happens real time. They get it, they share it. They're using that information, um, and particularly when the birds are rare, that there's even this you know, level of immediacy that's really impressive. You know, there are, there are many, many times where um, that has helped me see a bird. I will relay one story to you. I was having lunch downtown two winters ago. Um, I, I, you know, was you know, in the city at one of the restaurants there. I finished up my, my, my lunch with some friends. I just checked the, uh, the Facebook page on um, Birding Ohio. And 45 minutes before my lunch, someone had spotted a California gull down at um, uh, Edgewater. I was 15 minutes away, 10 minutes away. I, I had a light jacket, it was snowing, it was freezing out, the wind was blowing, it didn't matter, it was California gull. So, so I, I, I burst over there, I happened to have my scope in the car, but no camera, but I had my smartphone. The bird was there, Jen was there, <laughs> the soups were there, there was a, you know, there was a, a, a group of birds there uh, that were able to make it. It was midweek, so not everybody was available to get there. Um, but I had my, my, my cell phone and my scope. And so I was able to get a couple of documentary photos uh, of that day. But the only opportunity they had to see the bird was because I checked this Facebook group and I happened to be pretty close, so I, I got there. I, I, I'm supposed if I was at home, I, I would have made the 30 minute drive downtown as well, but that bird was gone at the end of that day. It was a small window. So the immediacy of social media benefited me to see that bird, um, an Ohio lifer, I've never seen that bird in Ohio uh, before. Okay, so that's my one story there. Um, let's talk a little bit more about social media. Uh, I, I divided that there's a lot of ways that these Facebook pages are divvied up in birding. One is by rarity. I mentioned the ABA Rare Bird Alert. For those of you that are really interested in knowing what's rare in North America around the country, crimson collared grosbeak, you know, nuttings flycatcher, these birds that come from you know, other continents to, to, to find themselves in the United States somewhere. This is a, a great site to, to follow and, um, and to learn more about some of these foreign, often foreign birds that show up for the first time or the very rarest of birds, those birds that somehow make their way across the southern borders or um, out from Siberia, hop over to the Aleutian Islands those rarest of rare birds. I, I just find that part of it fascinating. I, don't, I know I'll never get to Attu Island, which sits out you know, hundreds of miles from the rest of the Aleutian chain in you know, a, a place that's very tough to get to, very tough to, to stay. But I love reading about it, even though I'll never make it there. Um, the Ohio Chase Birds is a, is a bird uh, site, a Facebook group for sharing rare birds in Ohio, all across the state. So for those of us hungry listers that love to, you know, increase the number of birds species we've seen in Ohio, that's the, that's the place to look. But again, even if we're just interested, it's great to live vicariously through others, to learn about these species that are rare 
in Ohio. Uh, I had a conversation this morning with a friend, and we were talking about phalaropes and, you know, the relative rarity of those phalaropes. And you get Wilson's a little more regularly than the other two. Red necked a little less regularly than Wilson's, perhaps. And red phalarope. Now, when the red phalarope show up, that's a bird that, you know, shows up on chase birds. And folks are really interested. So, you know, reading some of this information on Ohio chase birds gives you an opportunity to get a sense of relative rarity of species. Um, you know, location. So, first is rarity, then this location. So, Birdie, Ohio is a site, uh, a general birding site where lots of lots of information is shared about birds. Folks take, you know, photographs of um, bald eagle nests and share those, and um, you know, their backyard birds, and you know, some rare birds, and um, they just it's a site to share birding information for birds around Ohio. It's a it's a very open. Um, site that um, welcomes discussions and it can be very educational. There are also a number of, of Facebook sites around bird uh, families and bird species. I, I just picked this one out because I, um, I had uh, an email <coughs> conversation with a, a, a woman who was an officer of this international Turco society. And Turcos are um, Eurasian African, and I think some, there are some Asian species. I think there's probably about 18 uh, Turcos in the family. I got interested because I started studying to bird in Uganda, and it's still a hope someday that I'll make it there. Two really beautiful, uh, relatively common Turcos there led me to this conversation and to this website. There's a website all about Turcos. Um, but if you want to look up um, um, other bird families, um, you can find um, sites devoted to woodpeckers in the world, kingfishers in the world. Um, uh, I found a site that was devoted to sparrowhawks and goshawks only. The word only is in the title. Sparrowhawks and goshawks only. So you can find a lot of Facebook sites. Um, if you're interested in a group of birds, that might be a way to, to get some education. I, you know, I talked a little bit about Twitter and the biggest week in American birding. For those of you that have made it out during that festival, one of the one of the tools that they use to share sighting information is a Twitter feed. So they, they share that information with attendees through their through their program book and through some other means. Um, and you 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 know you add you follow the biggest week Twitter feed, and periodically the guides that are working both the boardwalk and all the event locations, post information on tweets about birds that are being seen. So if a Connecticut warbler is seen in Pearson Park outside of Toledo, folks can go there and try and see that bird. And that's the kind of bird that folks would want to see and you know because of its relative rarity. You know, I, I, I happen to be lucky earlier this winter I was in I was in uh, Saxon Bog, for those of you that don't know, it's in northern Minnesota, it's north of Duluth. So the, the craziest of us go uh, where it's colder in winter rather than where it's warmer. <laughs> we started burning there one morning, 28 degrees below zero. Um, but without a wind, it just doesn't feel that cold. Uh, <laughs> one, one of the tools that they use is it's a, a, it's a dry cold. It's a dry yeah. cold, thank you. <laughs> it's a dry cold, yes. Yeah. Um, so there's a mobile tool that is used in the Saxon area, a relatively small area that is um, that has just a handful of birds, but those birds are heavily sought after. Things like great gray owl, northern hawk owl, pine grosbeak, evening grosbeak, boreal chickadee. These kinds of birds that you know, for many of us, we rarely get a chance to see those kinds of birds in Ohio. But in the in the bog, they. Uh, recommend a tool, they, they use a tool that's very similar to Twitter um, called Telegram. And it's a messaging, a mobile messaging tool for a short range, but the messages, it, it, it follows sort of a dialogue throughout each day, a bird seen in the bog, where, and so on. So similar to that idea of the Twitter messages, but, um, you know, I, I signed up while I was there, read about it, Signed up while I was there. We used it for the three days we burned, and then I deleted the site. But it was great because it told us when the sharp-tailed grouse were coming to the lake, so we could be there at 
that location, and we knew what, what was happening. So for us, it really enhanced that trip. Um, you know, I'm going to try one more time, cross my fingers, and see if we can get into uh, eBird here. So one of the real benefits of eBird, <coughs> crossing my fingers as this will come up, uh, is that it's bird finding capability. If it doesn't come up, we can certainly discuss it. Uh, but there's so many tools within eBird based on all that data that's been collected that you know, the Tim was talking about. It benefits us from a conservation standpoint as well. And ultimately, we all ought to feel good about that. We ought to feel maybe encouraged to use eBird because of that. But the benefit for us, if we're looking for birds, if it's not you know, one of those days where we're just really happy to be out and see what we see, but we're actually, you know, maybe I'm, I'm really interested in seeing um, you know, my first yellow like sapsucker of the season. I can go on and say, see, you know, where are yellow-bellied sapsuckers being seen here early, early in there, or maybe now mid through their migration through this area? And I could, you know, ask a few folks in this room who bird quite a bit out in the field this time of year, and they have some ideas. But I could go on to eBird using the data that they have, using a couple of tools under a function that's called Explore, and I could do some species mapping where I could look pretty closely at where those birds are being seen in the area on a map. Um, I can explore hotspots, those areas that have been identified as sort of bird-heavy areas that are frequently birded, that have a number of species that regularly occur there. Um, I can look for, I can set alerts so that if a bird I'm looking for is seen, I'll get an email. Um, and I can use this explore regions function to um, figure out, maybe if I'm kind of just doing a little point and shooting, I'm not sure where, I've got an idea that, you know, I think I read something on Facebook about Wendy Park having some of these birds. So I could go to the Wendy Park hotspot and explore, you know, the reports, the recent visits to Wendy Park to see, you know, what has been seen. Have there been yellow belly taps that were seen there? And as I'm looking through this, I might even check the illustrated checklist, which is essentially a, an abundance chart um, throughout the year at that hotspot. So it can tell me, even if there aren't recent reports, it can tell me how likely that bird is to be there. So from a bird finding perspective, eBird has all this great functionality and capability. Um, there's a, a couple of tools called um, Bird's Eye, and one that I just discovered yesterday called GoBird, very similar to Bird's Eye. Bird's Eye has a, a, a bunch of functionality. One of the, its best features, or the features that my birding friends who use it like the most, is a, a functionality that allows the birder to um, seek birding uh, lists within a given radius um, and a given time period of days, say one week before today, two weeks before today, 10 days, maybe I want to look within a 10 mile radius. You set those filters from the location that you're at um, and, and let, it do, let it do its thing and it will tell you the birds that have been seen based on uh, eBird data. Um, so for um, birds looking for specific species or um, the rarest of species, um, the tools like Bird's Eye and Go Bird are terrific. Bird's Eye has a is is a uh, one of those tools that you know provides some functionality free, and then you subscribe to some of its additional functionality. Go Bird is really similar, but it's a it's um, it's a basic functionality. It's also free. I, I would suggest if you're interested, take a look at both those tools. Um, so that's bird finding. Bird identifying, um, simply put, we look to help identify species through visual and auditory clues. Um, visual identifiers include some question sets. I mentioned the fact that Merlin has this functionality. If, if you don't take the photo, but you go through a, a set of questions, and it might have things like, 
They say up here, habitat. You know, what's the color of the bird? What's the shape of the bird? There's, a, I think, about nine or 12 sets of, uh, nine or 12 questions. And you answer as many of those as you can, uh, assuming that you've got a location identifier um, for where you're seeing that bird on. You've, you've, you've allowed location functionality on your, uh, your phone to, to be working. It will come and suggest to you what you might be seeing. And that functionality exists not just in Merlin, but we're seeing some subset of that in many of these field guide apps as well. So if you have a field guide app on your phone, you might want to check it to see if it has some of those filtering capabilities to help suggest what you're seeing. Uh, you know, there are now, we, we talked about um, this artificial intelligence that we're gathering and proving our ability to identify birds through the photographs. The same thing is happening on the song and call side of things. Um, you know, we've, we've got some tools, uh, you can see I've listed Song Sleuth, BirdNet, both allow you to record a bird song with your phone, allow it to, to go into the database, be analyzed, and then tell you what you're hearing. The functionality is very good, getting better. Um, it, it, it really is exciting technology, and so I, um, I encourage you to explore um, these tools, and then th there are others, but um, Song Sleuth, uh, I, I tried to test that. I didn't have a, a lot of success, but in reading reviews, um, I've read both positive and uh, negative reviews. Um, for a lot of the software, still early on, they're, they're working the bugs out, not quite yet as advanced, I don't think, as the um, Merlin uh, photo identification, but getting better. On the same path, Tim, I think, um, really uh, improving. And as their database grows, it will only get better. Any questions about, about that? I do. I want to be better than the other. Are these all free apps, first of all, or the ones that you looked at, the Merlin and whatever? And yes, about? yes. Yeah. The, these are all free apps. Um, are there ones that are that are subscription that you pay for that might be slightly better than these or more accurate? Or? Um, I, I'll throw that out to any of you who might use them. I, I don't use um, okay. them as frequently. I've, as I said, I've used Merlin. We'll talk about iNaturalist, which is a, a broader um, um, program to uh, also to photograph um, plants, birds, animals, and get uh, an ID from that. Um, as far as I'm aware, most of these tools are free. But they come with an understanding that, you know, much of this work is in development. So um, the expectation probably is that the better tools, as you're suggesting, are the ones that at some point may be able to charge for the app. Because they can verify what's in there. Right, if, if they have the best data set, they have the best capability to accurately identify, they might see that, that you know, they can outcompete those free systems, okay. potentially. Free is good. Free is good. And, and, you know, Merlin comes from Cornell. I know Cornell, you know, has to pay the bills just like everybody else, but they're just, um, it, 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 it seems to me that um, they're, cost structure allows for them to continue to develop these tools and offer them for free because of uh, the fact that they're, they're based on an educational organization. Um, okay, moving here. Um, so the field guide apps, um, ju just tr terrific tools now um, for those of us that are comfortable in, in looking at or, or you know interested in looking at our phone instead of a book, expanded information, being able to hear bird songs, being able to use the filtering technology. Some of these tools allow us to keep our bird records right in the system, be able to upload photographs into um, that field drop guide app um, community group. Uh, there is just a tremendous amount of capability that just can't exist uh, in paper format. Um, and 
I'll freely admit I will never, ever do away with my, bir my bird books, my field guide books, but I love having this additional option. Um, and we talked about the fact that we can play the bird songs and calls. Um, I'll remind all of you that we should do that very judiciously and be mindful of the effect that it might have on the birds that we're observing. So be very, very careful. I would you know, suggest certainly not playing that during breeding season. We know that birds use up energy responding to those calls. Um, there's certainly a lot of dialogue about how much, relatively how much energy does it build. I, I always would prefer that we uh, err on the side of caution to not disturb particularly breeding birds. But for that matter, it's, it's worrisome to me that we might um, have a migrating bird expend extra energy when it is so precious, uh, their energy, to, to be able to make those journeys. Um, so I, I just ask that you consider that when you are playing these um, songs and calls in the field. Um, so we talked a bit about these search and filter tools that exist right in the field guides. They, we don't have to use Merlin. Some of the field guide tools have them right there. Um, I listed you know, five of the most popular field guides that have these apps. You know, iBird Pro is the only one of these four that doesn't have a book. They are app only, mobile device only, and, you know, quite honestly, they, they've been in the game for a while. They've got a pretty good app. Um, I, you know, um, each of them, except for National Geographic, has a web page, and some of them have demos. So, um, you might want to explore those if you're interested in taking a look. Maybe you've got one of these apps on your phone, or maybe you don't have any and you'd like to explore. Check out their web pages to see what kind of functionality they each offer. And just like with the books, you, you, will, um, you may find you have a preference for one or the other. Uh, when it comes to documenting birds, many of us come from the, 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 the I have, and it was suggested earlier, uh, of a crate full of checklists. The, the checklist that I got from Bouvira National Wildlife Refuge in Kansas, from um, uh, Montezuma National Wildlife Refuge in Syracuse. Wherever I went, I would grab a checklist and the birds that I observed there, I'd check it off. And so I have that, you know, from 30 years coming forward until the last three or four years when I've been putting information directly into eBird. Um, the tool helps me put in a record immediately, real time, and then that record is captured. Um, I've been going back over time and adding my records into eBird, all my checklists so that I have a, a, a free, backed up set of my birding records. And it, it really is a terrific tool from that perspective of being able to know that my documented records are saved, <coughs> but even more so that they are adding, contributing to the data that makes up the records that are contributing to us being able to conserve habitat, to protect species. This is all tremendous work that's being done. But it doesn't happen without our records. So being able to add these older records was a real uh, great exercise. Uh, so, uh, you know, we, we talked about eBirdie, but uh, I remember about 10, 12 years ago, I bought a software package. One of these listed here, a tool called Avisys, that second record uh, under 3B. One of, you know, a dozen or so of these birding software packages. It's essentially a database, a database record of a birds. And I, I, you know, I took my checklist, I entered it in there, and that gave me the ability to see, you know, do kind of some reporting for myself. It was a lot of fun. Uh, so some of you may still be using it. I know folks who are avid eBirds who still put their data into one of these data tools because of the reporting capability that eBird doesn't quite have yet. Um, but these are, are common, work commonly, some no longer um, supported, but you know, you can see there are just a ton of these uh, programs that all were developed initially before eBird. Um, and then, you know, we wouldn't be uh, giving the whole picture uh, uh, without mentioning these naturalist programs, um, I, I was really impressed with iNaturalist um, uh, botanist that I know. I was out in the field, he was showing me, taking a picture of, you know, a native shrub or plant. Uh, within seconds, the, the, the 
program the app identify that, that um, shrub. Um, iNaturalist, you can, you can put all your sightings in there. If you want to put bird sightings, great. Mammal sightings, great. Rap, reptiles, amphibians, insects, plants. Um, you can keep all those records in one tool, iNaturalist. Um, iGoTerra is similar, observation.org. Wildlife Recorder, I think, is a, is a British program. But, so that this is just to show there are a number of programs like that. If you are a broader naturalist, you can record uh, more than just birds. Uh, so here, here's some of the ways that we um, document the birds beyond eBird. We can, you know, we can take photographs and audio recordings with our smartphones now. Uh, boy, that, that seems like a blinding glimpse of the obvious, but for those of us that have been birding for 30 years, it's just amazing. Um, audio recording apps, you know, we know we've got cameras, but you can, you can put a specific audio recording app, you can download something like RecForge or um, uh, Rody Rec uh, for Apple. Um, and those tools are slightly advanced in their capabilities of recording. The quality is a little bit better. Um, you can then uh, use those in, in um, uh, better formats. There's visual capability um, in some of those programs. But, um, you know, it just, I think it, it's just an example of of some of the additional capability here. And then once we have these photographs and these recordings, we can add them right into eBird as part of that record. To, you know, I, I really enjoy taking photographs uh, of rare species and, and putting them in my eBird record. Uh, I think it helps document and support the, the records for, um, for the scientific data that's, that's being um, gleaned. Uh, and of course, folks love to share photographs on social media. That's probably one of the most popular uses of social media, Facebook pages and others, uh, where folks love to share their photographs and start conversations. Uh, so there's a lot of current tech in, uh, in, in the area of photography. And, and many of you know what digiscoping is, which is putting your smartphone up to the back of your scope or one of your binocular eyepieces getting the magnification from that and being able to take a photograph. Um, so digiscoping has become very popular over the last five to 10 years. There are now tools that attach, help attach your smartphone directly to the eyepiece of a, of a, uh, a spotting scope. Um, there are uh, nest box feeder and trail cameras, some with night vision that allow folks who have property where animals come to, to photograph those animals. You, know, you see coyote photos, possum photos, you know, out west we see bear photos and you know, bobcat photos. Um, and, and these last two are related to digiscoping. You can, you know, buy a binoc binocular, a, a small scope, attach your phone to it to be able to, you know, look, up, observe something through that binocular or to photograph it, which is essentially digiscoping. But the unit is separately uh, obtainable. And then uh, some of these uh, smartphones, some, there's technology which allows you to buy a telephoto lens specifically for smartphones. It looks like some of you use that or have those. Uh, you keep it in your pocket. If you want to increase the, you know, the, your depth of your, your ability to, to magnify what you're looking at 10 times, 15, 20 times maybe, Pull out that telephoto lens, attach it to your smartphone, and observe the bird through that. It really just tremendous technology. Yeah. And then, you know, we've been talking about sharing observations. I don't want to uh, um, uh, go over this too frequently. Here are some of the constructs around the rarity of, you know, ABA rare birds. I can, you know, share my observations about really rare birds around the country. I have chase birds for those birds that many of us would like to see that are less common in Ohio. And then sharing sightings, pictures, videos, and uh, just discussions around birds for birding Ohio. We mentioned um, the Twitter type groups, and then eBird reporting. Tim, do you want to you want me to cover this, or do you want to talk a little bit about some of these um, 
some of these uh, activities that we can get involved in and use technology. Yeah, I mean, these, this is, um, these are just some good ways <coughs> to get involved. Uh, the Christmas Bird Count is really the, the, the first citizen science project that was ever formed. I mean, it was formed 100 years ago, over 100 years ago now, and it really was a group of people that um, looked at, at an option of not shooting birds. It was just a way to observe birds. So for over 100 years, that Christmas bird count um, has been documenting species. So it's sort of a historic um, way uh, or to look at citizen science. Um, breeding bird surveys, uh, there's breeding, sur you can be involved in breeding bird surveys anywhere in the, in the United States. We do our own set here in Cleveland Metro Park. Breeding bird surveys are a little more rigorous. You have to have um, the skills to do that. Most of it's audio. Um, you, the, the way we do it here in Cleveland Metro Parks is that we, we, we will field test you or test you to make sure that you're up to, to par to do that. So that is a little more difficult, but if you are, um, have a really good ear for birds, uh, there's a lot of um, things you can do regarding the breeding birds. Um, the great backyard bird counts, um, that's something, you know, uh, usually in February, that's through Cornell. It's just a way of watching your feeders. So we have throughout the world, everybody is looking, basically getting a snapshots of birds in your backyard on that one day, which is really a great way to be involved. Um, nest box is, is a, sort of a, a part of um, Eber or Cornell away again, but it's just looking at success rates. So if you have bluebird boxes in your backyard, it's a way of recording those, what activity, what's nesting there, what's not nesting there, the success rate, things like that.